All right. The lights are down, so I guess we can start. <laughs> Good afternoon, and thank you all for coming and staying so late for this session, given it's uh, really the, the terminal phases of the meeting, which I think uh, is really speaks to the importance of this topic. Um, the session is Hepatitis C Cure, Reality for Few and a Dream for Many. Uh, my name is uh, Marina Klein. I'm from the McGill University Health Center in Montreal, Canada. I'm a member of the Governing Council. And uh, it's really a pleasure to end this conference with a meeting focused on these issues in hepatitis C when we began the meeting uh, only three days ago with an opening, uh, very successful conference focused on co-infection. And, and out of that meeting, it's quite clear that one of the things that's really going to be important to achieve elimination goals around hepatitis C is that we have the involvement of every sector that's uh, involved in the science uh, the policy making, the implementation, and the community. Uh, otherwise, we're never going to achieve those targets. So it's a really great pleasure for me to be able to welcome a really distinguished panel today, which is interesting because we actually have two hepatologists. And that's something that is, has been unusual to date uh, in the field of HIV. This int the, the two worlds have been running along in parallel tracks for some time. But over the last several years, I think this intersection, uh, and we can certainly learn from them, and they, uh, I think, have felt that they can learn from us, and certainly in the terms of the, the, act, the community response to these infection so I think we're going to have a very exciting session you'll notice that we are missing one speaker on our panel today so I think we actually may wrap up a little bit early which maybe those in the audience will appreciate I'm going to let my uh, co-chair introduce herself and then we will get underway good morning everybody my name is Anja Żakowicz uh, I come from Poland uh, I live currently in Amsterdam I work for AIDS Healthcare Foundation Europe and I'm director of program uh, programs uh, that we run in uh, in Europe, in several countries in Europe, uh, which also covers the uh, Eastern European countries, Ukraine and Russia. But I'm also the member of uh, uh, of the board of Medicine Patent Pool, and and probably as you know, recently the Medicine Patent Pool uh, broader its scope of of work. Uh, from HIV to, to also hepatitis C uh, and TB and medicine patent pool is a, <coughs> a voluntary uh, licensing mechanism which allows uh, to, to, to bring cheaper medications to low and middle income countries and I'm really happy that today we will be discussing both the science but also the activism and what really uh, and, and policies also and what we really all uh, we need to do together to to bring uh, the, the the medications that we have right now to to cure people who need the cure and uh, to to allow on on life and also the the, the healthy life and, and quality of life for those who live with a hepatitis C. Thank you. So now it's my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Stanislas Paul who is a professor in hepatology and gastroenterology at the Université Paris Descartes in the city. He is the head of the liver department at the Cochin Hospital in Paris, uh, and his research interests involve the study and impact of immune deficiency, including HIV, on the natural history of viral hepatitis, the treatment of viral hepatitis, and the reversal of cirrhosis. He co-leads the research at INSERM's unit studying the immune pathology of hepatitis C viral infection, and he'll be speaking to us uh, today on a state-of-the-art update on hepatitis C virus cure. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Marina. Thank you, Anna. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Bienvenue à, à Paris et à cette conférence. It's not exactly a state-of-the-art because uh, uh, my title uh, was uh, Reality for Few and, and Dream for uh, Many regarding uh, HCVQ, and so I will mainly discuss uh, the uh, more recent uh, data and how to achieve uh, HCVQ. So thank you again for the invitation. This is uh, my uh, disclosure. So, so just to begin some uh, updated uh, data from uh, the uh, WHO, uh, which have been uh, presented at the last uh, EASON meeting, I think it's uh, important to observe that, of course, uh, HIV infection is uh, a global infection with a high number of uh, infected patients, but uh, the uh, last estimation is uh, 71 million infected. And remember, then uh, 10 years ago, it was uh, around 170. So uh, uh, significant progress uh, uh, have been made. 
Among these uh, uh, 71 million, uh, there are uh, around 2.3 million of uh, co-infected patients. And of course, uh, there is a wide variation of uh, the epidemiology according to the uh, geographical areas. And you know the high uh, prevalence and incidence in Middle East, especially in Egypt or in Mongolia. Despite this uh, decreasing prevalence, uh, there is, uh, however, an increasing mortality with uh, a 22% increase since uh, 15 years. And if we consider uh, HIV infection, there is uh, around uh, four to 500,000 deaths yearly, which are uh, mainly related to the complication of cirrhosis and also to hepatocellular carcinoma and probably extrahepatic uh, uh, morbidity. So clearly a significant uh, uh, issue. And this is a summary of uh, HIV infection. And of course, we are very well aware of the uh, liver disease, which is uh, usually the introduction of the patient in the uh, cascade of uh, care with uh, cirrhosis or hepatocellular carcinoma. But in addition to this liver disease, uh, there is also extrahepatic manifestation. One of them are including vasculitis, which are related to cryoglobulinemia. Half of the patients infected by HCV have cryoglobulinemia, and according to the studies, uh, 10 to 40 percent have uh, a, a significant manifestation with uh, purpura, arthritis, glomerulonephritis, or uh, mainly uh, 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 peripheric neuropathies. And finally, this uh, vasculitis may result uh, in a clonal expansion and in the occurrence of uh, lymphoma, uh, B lymphoma, and so uh, HCV has to be considered as an oncogenic uh, virus. And in parallel with this liver disease and vasculitis, there are also uh, several manifestations which are uh, related to the uh, chronic inflammation, exactly like for uh, chronic HIV infection. And this is uh, illustration in the Taiwanese uh, uh, court uh, study, the reveal study of this hepatic and extrahepatic impact. And uh, you may observe this uh, more than tenfold increase uh, in the mortality associated with the hepatic disease in the viremic patients as compared to patients either who resolved their infection or who have not been infected. And if we consider the extrahepatic manifestation resulting in mortality, there is a twofold increase associated with extrahepatic disease as compared to uninfected population. And this uh, uh, Higher mortality is mainly related to diabetes, to vascular morbidity and mortality, cardiovascular, cerebrovascular, renovascular, as well as to extrahepatic cancers. And it is suggested that this risk, which are uh, related to chronic inflammation, are around two to three as compared to uninfected uh, population. These are uh, the results of the old treatment, uh, the interferon including regimen. So you know that uh, this uh, last uh, 20 years we have been using the interferon based uh, treatment uh, where there is an increasing rate of uh, sustained virologic response. But at the beginning of uh, the years 2000, it was only half of the patients who were achieving a sustained virologic response. The sustained virologic response, SVR, uh, which is defined by undetectability of uh, HCV RNA 12 weeks now after the end of therapy, is a complete cure because uh, there is uh, no reservoir and no uh, genomic integration. So really, it's uh, the first uh, viral, chronic viral infection which may be curable. But at that time, it was only half of the patients, at least those infected by genotype 1, with a, a long-term treatment, 24 to 48 weeks, and with a poor safety profile. So it was really a very difficult treatment that we were uh, 
usually uh, reserving to the difficult to treat patients because they do need the treatment because a higher risk of progression of fibrosis. Patients infected by genotype 1, HIV co-infected patients, those patients with significant fibrosis or cirrhosis, those patients with metabolic syndromes or uh, fatty liver, and finally uh, those patients with uh, non-CC IL-28B, you know that these uh, polymorphisms have been associated with a poor response as well as uh, these uh, comorbidities. And so the SVR rate at that time was usually more around 30% in those population than around 50%. And with the development and the understanding of the viral replication of uh, the hepatitis C virus, uh, the target of the antiviral uh, have been identified and developed, and so we have now the opportunity to use uh, inhibitors of uh, the protease, NS3, NS4, inhibitors of uh, the replication complex, NS5A, and inhibitors of the polymerase, NS5B. And by using a combination of these different inhibitors, it's uh, now the rule to achieve SVR. So these are the approved drugs today, uh, at least in the northern countries. Some of them are co-formulated and uh, once daily pill for eight to 12 weeks allows uh, SVR. Uh, some are a combination of two different pills. Uh, Others are a combination of uh, uh, two to uh, four pills, but with uh, very high efficacy. So I will not go into the details uh, of the name. I think that the very important point uh, is that the very high rate of sustained virologic response greater than 95% has been reported also in the real life. And as you know, in a lot of countries, we had really the opportunity to use uh, all these drugs in a compassionate use. And these are some uh, 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 different results from different countries indicating that whatever the combination, whatever the patient's profile, we have more than 90% of cure in this population. And it is not worthy that uh, the previous predictors of poor response to uh, interferon including regimen, uh, uh, example uh, given uh, HIV co-infection, diabetes, obesity, uh, experience uh, uh, treatment uh, are no, uh, not anymore uh, limiting uh, factors for achieving SVR. The only clear limiting factor is the severity of the cirrhosis and those patients with the so-called child B or child C, namely decompensated cirrhosis, have SVR rates which are around 80% and need uh, reinforced treatment. So this is a, a summary of the situation today. So by using this uh, oral combination of uh, direct acting antivirals, uh, it's possible to achieve more than 95% of sustained virologic response, namely of virologic cure. The safety profile of all these uh, uh, drugs and combination is uh, really fair. Uh, different uh, uh, adverse events have been uh, reported. Arrhythmias, which are uh, mainly associated with the use of polymerase inhibitors. Pulmonary hypertension, but uh, the link with the treatment is uh, more difficult to prove, and we know that, of course, severe cirrhosis may be associated with pulmonary hypertension. Some cases of HBV reactivation, mainly in HBV and HCV co-infected patients have been reported. And so the recommendation is to check the HBV DNA before the treatment and during and after the treatment, especially in case of uh, increase of transaminase or HBV DNA, and to discuss uh, the introduction of uh, nucleotides or nucleotides analogs for HBV. But these are uh, really rare situation without uh, uh, very significant uh, clinical 
impact. A last point regarding the safety is the risk which has been suggested of occurrence or recurrence of hepatocellular carcinoma. And so the hypothesis is that by decreasing the inflammation by using these very rapid uh, efficient drugs, there is a decrease in the immune surveillance at the uh, liver level and a risk of occurrence of uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. This has been suggested last year, and we have now really a lot of studies which uh, suggest uh, that there is no signal. This is the example of uh, a meta-analysis which has been recently presented, and I think the important point is a methodological approach. And by using a ponderation in this different study, it is uh, possible to demonstrate that the relative risk after adjustment suggests that there is either no increased risk or even a decreased risk of occurrence or recurrence of hepatocellular carcinoma, while if there is no adjustment, we have a, a, a threefold increase in the risk of uh, occurrence of hepatocellular carcinoma. But this is related to the fact that we are now treating very severe patients that could not be treated previously given the uh, adverse effects associated with the pegylated and ribavirin combination. In this uh, study from the uh, collaborative uh, hepatocellular group uh, from ANRS, we have uh, uh, recently reported that uh, regarding the recurrence of hepatocellular carcinoma in patients achieving a first cure of hepatocellular carcinoma, there was no difference of recurrence in those patients who were treated or not treated by DAs. And this is the uh, first uh, prospective demonstration that probably there is uh, no signal in this population. The uh, severe cohort also of uh, ANRS uh, result in the same conclusion. And we are now uh, preparing our uh, updated uh, database of more than 14,000 treated patients. And clearly, there is no difference regarding the occurrence of hepatocellular carcinoma in treated and untreated patients after uh, ponderation by using an IPTY uh, methodology. So, we can achieve SVR with a fair safety without a major concern uh, regarding these uh, different uh, adverse events. And we know that probably, like the interferon-based regimen, this SVR will result in clinical benefit. And so this is uh, the uh, demonstration again that in those patients achieving SVR with treatment or spontaneously, there is a marked decrease in the hepatic or extrahepatic mortality, which is really similar to that ob obtained in the general population without prior HCV infection. So probably the uh, conclusion could be this is the end and we can achieve HCV cure given the high and uh, pangenotypic efficacy of uh, the available different regimens which are easy to use with a fair safety with this uh, unique chronic viral infection which may be cured. Uh, uh, associated with clinical benefit uh, as well as the, the hepatic and the extrahepatic level. But indeed, it's not the end. It is the end of the beginning, especially because we have some limitation to HCV cure. This is true in all the countries, but of course it's uh, uh, more true in those countries than in the north. And this is mainly related to some limitation regarding the screening, the access to care, and the cost of these uh, different therapies. So regarding the screening, clearly we need easy tools, and easy tools which may allow a rapid diagnosis in order to discuss, to test, and treat the patients. So we have now these tools of uh, rapid diagnosis, 
uh, by using uh, blood spot, by using salivary uh, samples, you may uh, obtain very accurate serological results. But you can also uh, use point of care devices, which in 20 minutes allow to give you a very sensitive diagnosis of varemia. And so given uh, the uh, fact that we have uh, pangenotypic drugs, uh, it's possible to test the patients and to discuss to treat those patients who have uh, detectable varemia. Uh, there are a lot of uh, devices. Of course, uh, they have uh, their own cost. Uh, but uh, we have, of course, to develop uh, all these uh, tools for HBV and HCV. The second limitation is uh, the access to care. And we have exactly the same cascade that you have in HIV infection. Uh, be aware that all these figures are inaccurate. And just as an example, even if we are world champion, it's not 5% of the French infected population uh, uh, who have been treated, but more probably around 30 to 50%. So just consider that whatever the figures, we need to improve the access to care of those patients who have been diagnosed as uh, uh, being anti-HCV positive and HCV RNA positive. And especially because there is this paradox between the prevalence of the infection and the access to care. And these are the uh, example of uh, Egypt and Mongolia, again around 14 to 15% of the population as active infection, as you know. So uh, 100 million of uh, Egyptians are infected, and it's less than 1% of them who have access to the treatment. And those, despite a very active uh, uh, policy of the government to allow around uh, 100 and 150,000 treatments per year. So clearly, there is some improvement which are needed uh, for the access to care. And finally, of course, the cost of the HCV cure is high. In uh, uh, northern country, it's around 27 to 45,000 euros for the cure. So uh, a lot of studies have uh, suggested that uh, these treatments are cost effective. Uh, for example, in France, at this very high cost around 40,000 uh, euros for genotype 1 and genotype 4 infected patients. The treatment is cost effective, but clearly it is uh, uh, too high cost uh, to discuss an HCV elimination. And of course, HCV elimination is the next step. And so we have to reduce the uh, high cost of the treatment. And you know that we have now access to a lot of uh, different generic drugs. I give you the uh, example of uh, this uh, Mylan uh, 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 generic drug. I, I show it because it is a shared uh, patent with uh, companies. And so we know that uh, it is a true treatment, which is really efficient. We are using it uh, in our uh, sub-Saharan patients uh, without uh, coverage in France. And it's uh, rather low cost around $750 for 12 weeks of treatment, 500 for eight weeks, of course, uh, as compared, again, to uh, historically more than $40,000. Uh, 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 so finally, regarding the elimination program, uh, we have to adjust the policy to the epidemics and the uh, different geographical situation. I give you there the uh, example of the uh, French policy of this uh, last uh, three years. Uh, in the first step, uh, the Ministry of Health allowed the treatment of uh, the so-called priority patients. So patients with significant fibrosis, extensive fibrosis or cirrhosis, in order to prevent mortality and morbidity, including also the uh, liver transplant patients, and the patients with vasculitis given the very significant morbidity. After that, the uh, uh, Ministry of Health uh, uh, has extended the uh, treatment to the intermediate fibrosis, F2, and uh, discussed the treatment of uh, the population with uh, high incidence 
in order to prevent the new infection and to contain the uh, epidemic. And finally, since uh, last January, we are now allowed to treat all the patients. And of course, we consider that uh, probably there is still around 70 to 100,000 uh, uh, patients to treat and cure. And probably the uh, elimination should be achievable in the next uh, five to 10 years. And you know that there are other policies, uh, for example, micro-elimination programs uh, uh, focusing in a given population, PWID, in MSM, uh, in patients with uh, uh, renal impairment and especially in dialysis patients. And of course, all these uh, micro-elimination programs may allow to decrease the risk of uh, dissemination of uh, reinfection uh, for the uh, high-risk uh, population. So just to conclude, this uh, uh, presentation on HCV cure, a reality for few and a dream for many. HCV is a systemic disease and HCV related symptoms are mainly reversible with sustained biologic response. And I remember you that it's really impressive for uh, renal impairment in those patients with uh, uh, nephrotic syndrome because in uh, uh, three months, and it's also the same with uh, acrodermatitis, you have a cure of uh, the nephrotic syndrome or uh, of uh, the cutaneous defect. And you know also that early cirrhosis, child A cirrhosis are reversible, and uh, 10 to 40% of cirrhotic patients with child A cirrhosis may achieve reversibility of cirrhosis after five years. It is 70% biopsy proven demonstration in HBV patients. So clearly we need to identify those patients to treat and cure these patients. Despite this reversibility, the follow-up of those patients will be, will be maintained after SVR, uh, given the risk, of course, of hepatosuar carcinoma, even if it's significantly decreasing, given the risk of uh, progression of fibrosis despite SVR in those patients uh, with comorbidities, and also given the risk of uh, reinfection, which is uh, one of the main remaining issue in MSM and PWID, uh, given the risk, of course, of uh, re-exposure. And so that's why we have to prioritize the treatment of this uh, at-risk population. HCV elimination is feasible, but uh, improvement in screening, access to care, and cost reduction is, of course, mandatory if we want to uh, succeed. With that, I, I thank you for your attention. I thank you for the invitation. And uh, I would like to thank uh, the INRS. Uh, and uh, uh, you know that we have a big uh, hepater cohort with more than 21,000 HBV and HCV infected patients who will be followed for uh, 10 years with a lot of uh, uh, very valuable information. I mentioned, uh, of course, the risk of hepatocellular carcinoma, but we have uh, a lot of uh, interesting results uh, around the viral resistance and so on. I would like to, to thank the Institut Pasteur, Christian Brechot, my mentor and the director of Institut Pasteur, and all these uh, fair uh, friends uh, uh, with uh, whom we are collaborating my university and all my uh, uh, fair colleagues of uh, uh, my uh, liver department. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much uh, for a very clear uh, presentation that really sets the stage. Before we move on to the next presentation, we probably have time to take a few questions. Um, if there are any specific questions to clarify for the presentation. If not, we can hold those and incorporate them into the discussion. Okay. 
I would like to introduce Polly, <coughs> Polly Clyden. Uh, Polly works uh, at HIV Base in London, and it's a community organization that she co-founded. And Polly works mainly on optimi uh, optimizing uh, HIV treatment for uh, in low- and middle-income countries. But as many strategies that activists that used in HIV uh, are uh, right now being used to bring down the prices of hepatitis C, she's going to talk about bringing down the co uh, she's going to talk about bringing down the cost of hepatitis C treatment in resource-limited settings, and she's going to talk about the community perspective. <laughs> okay. Okay, that looks like my presentation. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for the IT support. Um, so thank you very much for everybody's for staying, this is the time that I was expecting everybody to go and see the Eiffel Tower or something, so it's nice to see a fairly um, full room this evening. Um, I've, I've done, I'm not an expert. I was kind of quite reluctant to, to do this talk because I feel that there are people that, and I'm going to thank some of them, that know far more about this than I do, but I've, I've done a lot of work in HCV and pricing from a sort of this community perspective. And so what we wanted to do was to show how some of the strategies that we used in HIV are also being used to bring down the cost of hepatitis C treatment. And so if you have any really difficult questions, I will send them somewhere else. Um, and I'm, <laughs> I wanted to put the, uh, my acknowledgements up front because I'm indebted to the following people who shared their slides with me. Um, each of them um, have been incredible in terms of bringing down the cost of hepatitis C treatment. So, and I, I expect that some of you probably went to see Andrew Hill's talk earlier. Um, Tracy Swan who's an extraordinary activist, as is Karen Kaplan and Celine Grillon. And so, anybody who's ever been to an HIV meeting, these, thing, these, these actions will look very familiar. Um, when Gilead announced the price of, of Sofospovir, it came in at an eye-watering $84,000 for a 12-week course of treatment, which sent kind of shock waves globally. There was kind of like everybody from the New York Times was kind of totally could not believe the prices. And so we had many protests and presentations which made comparisons with the price and the price of gold and the price of diamonds. So you can see here that, that people have wrapped themselves up in, in kind of gold leaf and, um, and that use that as a form of protest against the price. And um, I'd just like to show you a picture of the Hepatitis C Coalition who are a global coalition who've had some very creative actions again against the price of some of these drugs, including delivering liver. Um, to Gilead, <laughs> which I, I mean, one of the great things about some of the actions is the, the level of creativity that goes into them. And um, so you can see from the pricing campaigns, um, this is like, have a heart, save my liver. And this, these were amazing. Um, the activist that I was introducing earlier on, spent hours and hours and hours filling capsules with, with gold glitter, which they threw at various, um, various stands. But we see this price of $84,000 has really kind of struck a chord with many of us. And um, the high cost, once again, the $84,000, um, this is a an article from the New York Times, the high cost of hepatitis C drug prompts, prompts a call to void its patents. And um, again, this sort of 
One of the other tools that we've used in HIV and that has been very successful in HCV is, as well alongside protest, is litigation. So this describes some of the legal challenges that are going on in different countries to, um, to perhaps challenge the patents because um, they believe that some of them are invalid. And as you can see, the patent kills the patient. And um, this is just a map showing where some of these patent challenges are taking place. Because, oh, sorry, we know that generic DAAs are actually very cheap. They can be made very cheaply. Um, for under $100 for a four-week course for a two-drug combination. And this is, this, this, is, this is very interesting. That one of the, I mean, beyond protest litigation, one of the important things that we've always had is good information. So in order to protest against the cost, it's good to know how much it actually really costs to manufacture some of these very expensive drugs. So this just explains the methodology of how these final manufacturing costs are arrived at. So you can see that they calculate what's in it and then the kind of formulation kind of synthesis and um, adding on something for packaging, not allowing a very large profit margin and coming up with final generic estimations of possible prices. And um, this is an even cheaper one, which comes in at $8. And um, this, will, this, this is a really interesting slide from Andrew Hill's group that shows the span, the range of prices that um, are being charged for the same drug combinations in, in different selected countries. And the $47 at the end is the, is the goal, is the kind of, is, is the estimated prices. And um, a new movement to go with our 90-90-90, it, it would be not unreasonable to demand generic treatments for HIV, H hepatitis B, HCV and TB um, to be mass produced for less than $90 per patient, and in some cases this is per patient per year, obviously, with HIV and others for a course of treatment. Thank you. I would like to ask if there are any specific questions to Polly's presentation. I don't see any questions. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, and our third presentation today will be given uh, by uh, Udu Nijoya. He's a professor from Cameroon. He's a professor of hepatology and gastroenterology at the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Yaoundé. He's a principal investigator on a demonstrative project of using DAAs in Cameroon, and he brings to us an international perspective on this question because so many of our trials have been taking place in the north. I think it'll be very interesting to hear from other countries, thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Chair. Before starting my speech, I would like to, first of all, to express my gratitude to the organizers for this wonderful Come Together Scientific for giving me the opportunity to be here this afternoon to talk about uh, this uh, entitled speech, Implementation of Sustainable Hepatitis C Treatment Program in Cameroon. Uh, this is my disclosures. And then my outline of this speech will concern uh, epidemiology and burden of hepatitis C in Cameroon. Then we talk about the, the Cameroon government initiative to provide uh, direct action antivirals that we are going to call DAAs. Demonstration project of DAAs in Yaoundé with Farm Access and Job Lang Institute from Netherlands. And then the challenges in this uh, program concerning, first of all, the rollout of ACV screening and treatment in the country and uh, develop the, to develop the sustainable financing program as to finance this, uh, this, uh, this program. This is Cameroon here. Cameroon is this, uh, this triangular country here. I don't know if you can get it from there. At the 
year at the bottom of the Gulf of Guinea is a triangular country who has just in its back West Africa, just one country away from North Africa and one country away from East Africa. It's a particular country with a broad variety of cultures linked to a variety of climates. In fact, when you move from the south, sorry, when you move from the south up to the far north, you move from a deep, immune, dense forest, equatorial forest, to a Sahelian desert. All these peculiarities give a variety of cultures and practices. In the background of the general consideration, these tell us that HCV uh, is still a leading cause of cirrhosis and a particular carcinoma, as uh, Sanita just said not long ago. And these diseases, be it, be it uh, uh, SCC or cirrhosis, whose treatment is still a catastrophe for the poor, is very a real problem for the public health problem. Cameroon government have recognized ACV as a public health problem since uh, certain city at the same time and given a priority. And then the, the Ministry of Public Health have signed cooperative agreement with pharmaceutical companies to obtain DAAs at reduced price. If we take in account the figures of WHO, Cameroon is still a, still a high endemic zone of, for hepatitis C, as you see on this map here, where you still have, you still have genotype 1, genotype 2 pre prevalent, and some type of genotype 2, 20%. And where again there is a high co infection of HIV, HCV, if you take into account the, the work published by the uh, RNS uh, team in the Aounde, where it was up to 7% of co infection of hepatitis C and HIV. Even though we still have some controversies now in the figures concerning the prevalence, uh, the CDA Center of Disease Analysis, based on the actual data available, said that, uh, stated that there are six new infections yearly. These infections are related to the medical settings and also to ritual and cultural practices around the country. Talking about the cohort effect uh, in, the, in this country, the high prevalence of uh, hepatitis C in Cameroon is related, is somehow related to some past history situation where we had mass treatment against some tropical diseases and also with mass serial vaccination against some late, up to the uh, late 60s. All these situations bring out maybe what we call a, a cohort effect in Cameroon, where we see that most of the patients are aged more than, actually are more aged more than 50 because of that situation, probably. But nevertheless, the actual uh, situation of transmission led us to think that there are only other new way of transmission. Apart from the ancient way of transmission, there is also uh, transmission due to blood infected blood transmission because as a matter of fact we still rely in our country on only on the fact that we eliminate blood bad blood or I call it like that but in the transmission by only serological test as you know very well serology is not enough to eliminate blood transmission and the diversities elsewhere now we use a molecular biology apart from that we still also have the uh, traditional healers who use cutting instruments, sharp instruments for their, their, their treatment. And by using these sharp instruments and cutting instruments out of classical hygiene rules, they can transmit blood-borne viruses, including HCV. When we talk about this mass, this mass uh, this serial transmission, this mass uh, program for the treatment for tropical disease, it looks like some what would happen somewhere in Egypt. As a matter of course, when you see uh, what happened in Egypt, concerning the treatment against uh, schistosomiasis, you can easily compare the curve of, of uh, incidence and prevalence of uh, hepatitis C in Egypt and with what happened in South Cameroon uh, with the team of uh, Santo Pasteur de Cameroon who get a very nice uh, this, uh, research who showed effectively that there was something alike with the mass, uh, mass uh, practices of the cure or vaccination. Talking now about the burden of hepatitis C, it concerns mainly cirrhosis and hepatocellular carcinoma, where hepatitis C, once more, is account for more than 30% of causes, assumed causes, in these two diseases, where, as I, as I said not long ago, 
the treatment is really a difficulty, is a, a really a catastrophe for the poor countries. Linked to all these situations, the, the government have decided to take initiative to purchase, to make affordable DAAs. They therefore purchase DAAs at reduced price and then make it available to people by, with a small margin through a, create, a special created fund. Six treatment centers does exist actually in Yaoundé and Douala, but up to now we have, all, we have selected more than 2,500 patients for GAS treatment. The diagnosis of medical school is still to be paid by the patient, and the treatment availability is to be expanded uh, in, the other con in the other cities like Douala and Yaoundé. Linked to all these considerations, uh, Farm Access has decided to launch a program, which is called a demonstration program in Yaoundé, which aims at demonstrating the feasibility and achieving, to achieving high cure rate with Sophos-BV and ladies bv for genotype 1 and genotype 4, and Sophos-BV rebavarin for genotype 2. Also, to, that aims to evaluate adherence to the treatment and monitor side effects and impact of quality of life. I'm happy because Stanislav said not long ago, pointing out all the different difficulties that we have with uh, the treatment with uh, DAAs, and then also identifying, based on the experience from the provider, identifying organizational and operational requirements for further rollout, collect direct and indirect cost data to underpin cost effectiveness and rollout for rollout in the country. The methods of this uh, demonstration, the demonstration program, we are going to, in, we are going to enroll 120, 150 patients are in a mono-infected or co-infected with HIV patient, age at least 21 years, and then <clears throat> they are going to be in a multicentric study because you are going to live with uh, different six centers in the, in, the, in the capital city of Yaoundé, and we are going to use branded DAAs. We are going to exclude from this study Decompensated cirrhosis, hepatocellular carcinoma, patient with renal impairment, and patient with HBV positive test because as Stanis had not said not, say not long ago, that risk of reactivating hepatitis B or also we want to make sure that we are dealing with only patients who are only hepatitis C positive patient. Of course, we are going to rule out the, um, the pregnant women and also certain medication according to the manufacturer. That means medication that are contraindicated according to the manufacturers. Patients are going to be asked to pay one-fourth of the cost of the, the drug, around uh, $125. But those who may not afford the treatment will give the treatment for free. There's a visit schedule enrollment. A visit schedule is going to be start after enrollment every four weeks until the end of the treatment, then 12 weeks after the end of the treatment to assess the RNA viral load. This schedule is going to be adapted according to the HIV co-infected situation or cirrhotic patient and genotype 2 patients. Where have you been so far with this uh, demonstration program? Funding has been provided by Farm Access and Job Lange Institute for $740,000. GAs is going to be provided by Gilead at the same price at the do for the government, the Cameroon government. And then the ethical approval is already obtained. The training for clinicians is already done last July. And the, uh, the entry of patients is foreseen for September 2017. We assume that we are going to do our data analysis by summer 2018. All these programs seem very interesting, but there are challenges to, we are going to face out to roll out VSC treatment in Cameroon. The first one is lay on the patients and the population and the, uh, the diagnostic method, methods. Only a small minority of HCV infected patients are aware of the infection. That's exactly what uh, Saniza said not long ago. This is a point because if we, lie, we rely only on what we are seeing right now, we are going to have not enough good result with the data treatment. And then if you want to make sure that we have a very broad and clear aspect of prevalence, we ask ourselves, what should be the target population? Should we screen only in key population? 
Should we, should we still create uh, screen only people aged more than 50, taking advantage on the fact that we said that it was a cohort effect? Or should we see only HIV positive patients? All those uh, items are to be discussed and then to be as a challenge. By the way, diagnosis, the diagnosis of uh, HIV-RNA is still very on, uh, only available in three laboratories in Cameroon because not only is this not easy technically for, for people, but also it is expensive. Because so up to now, the patient have to pay up to 165 US dollars from the screening up to the genotyping. And that we need to come out with a simple, cheap and reliable diagnosis tools to make things easier for the people if you want to achieve a high curage in the population. The second group challenge deal with uh, the drugs. We still don't have pangenotypic drug, uh, pangenotypic as, as yet, but we should use branded drugs or at least WHO pre-qualified drugs to avoid resistance or to avoid, uh, or be, to be sure at least for the result that we are going to, uh, to bring out. And then cheaper genetic drugs are not yet passed WHO pre-qualification. Nevertheless, the simplified adapted treatment protocol is needed to make things easier for population. And um, we should also think about decentralizing the ACV treatment or management because up to now, it's only the specialists, I mean the gastroenterologists or uh, infectious uh, specialists who deal with uh, the treatment. We are asking ourselves if we should not expand this management to the GPs who are trained on for that purpose. The last, the third aspect of the challenge, but not the least, is the financing situation. There's an urgent need for a sustainable financing mechanism to found this program, because up to now we are still looking for ways to have a sustainable uh, program for that. And then there is hope that to achieve this high rate cure, up to the majority still unaware, because most of the people are still unaware of their situation. And these, if you want to really have a high cure rate, we should go for than those, with, those with patients we see every day. It means that we should go inside and have a large screening to make sure that the cure, the cure rate is going to be high and we rule out the hepatitis T. One of the advantages is the fact that the cell orders already expressed their commitment. So whatever the program of a sustainable uh, financing program, we should, lie, we should rely on the fact that stakeholders have expressed their commitment. So the trajectory to do, to look for funds should take that into account and see how we can develop a sustainable financing mechanism in the short term. Finally, Mrs. Medell, ladies and gentlemen, now that there is a will for combating hepatitis C, let us push our commitment forward to identify, to, identify, to definitely find the way. By so doing, the treatment to roll out hepatitis C should no longer be a reality for a few and a dream for many, but sincerely a real a reality for major people and for all. Before ending, I would like to thank uh, all the team who are, who are working very hard for the uh, combating hepatitis C, I mean uh, pharmacist program, Atlantic uh, consulting work with Ab Amadou, the, the colleagues from Douala, Yaoundé Central Hospital, and then other hospitals who are working very hard for that, uh, that uh, combat, we look forward to have a success for that. And then for that, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank, thank you very much. I think that was beautifully illustrating and all the aspects that are going to be challenges as we try to move forward towards elimination in all different sorts of settings, both resource rich and, and resource uh, constrained. Um, we have a lot of time actually for discussion uh, and I'd really like it if the audience participated because we have a lot of expertise of different varieties on the panel. So please uh, feel free to find a microphone. There are several in the back. Um, I think I'll just start off by um, picking up on one of the points that you raised in the, in the slide towards the end. Um, if we, it seems like now we actually have, it's clear we have a cure that's very effective. It's clear that we're getting to pricing of the, the drugs in many settings that is going to be affordable. There's still a lot of pressure that needs to be put on to bring that down to bear, but it's possible. We see that it's actually possible to get these drugs down. 
But what we don't yet see is how do we actually reach all the people who need to get access to these drugs. And one of the things we, you mentioned was differentiated care or moving models of care out of specialist circumstances into, the, uh, into more general practice settings or low threshold settings, particularly if we're looking at key populations. And I wonder if anybody on the panel had thoughts about that, because I think certainly one of our issues has been in, in uh, resource-rich settings is that these are often held within specialists. And I think in Europe, this is one of the major challenges that, uh, and probably will be so in other settings too. Any thoughts? Well, thank you. <laughs> Now, probably the uh, answer is the same whatever the, the country, but uh, the methodology is not exactly the same. Of course, uh, in Cameroon, for example, there is a high prevalence, uh, persisting high incidence, and probably a, a higher incidence than prevalence. And of course, it's not exactly the same in uh, Western countries. So. Uh, uh, probably the, the, the tools will not be exactly the same for screening. Uh, the main message, which are absolutely similar, is that we can clearly cure everybody uh, who has been diagnosed. So we have to think to the uh, way to perform the diagnosis. And uh, probably in very great countries like Cameroon, uh, without uh, uh, very huge coverage of uh, uh, specialist, we heard that there is uh, six uh, treatment centers mm -hmm. in uh, Yaoundé. Uh, we have to externalize uh, the uh, diagnosis and the treatment. Uh, of course, it's not the case in Paris because we have a lot of uh, uh, specialists <coughs> and it's very easy to, to find a specialist to, to be uh, diagnosed and, and treated. And so, and this is really a, a global issue. We have to adapt uh, all the policies according to the different region mm. and situation and it's, it's not very easy. For example, the American recommendation of uh, screening the baby boomers uh, is not efficient in Italy because most of the patients are older than 70. Of course, it will be uh, completely different uh, in UK and in Cameroon. So uh, I think that we have uh, uh, the, the need for uh, uh, global thinking of how to cover all these uh, heterogeneities uh, in order to improve the access to care. Regarding the treatment, it's not the patients, it, it, it's not the doctors who, who are uh, really deciding, so it's a, a, a political discussion. I, I will not go into this uh, way because it's an eternal discussion in France, but finally the government uh, in a discussion with the companies is fixing the price. So uh, there is uh, a virtuous position assuming that uh, the price is too elevated, it's true, but it's a governmental decision. So if you want to make it lower, uh, make it lower. Yes, I think Sani is actually right because uh, the situation should be really think according to the countries, according to the region, according to the policies, according to the financial situation of every country. So we cannot have a state rule for everybody. We should think locally, adapt our solution locally, and then uh, even, for the, uh, even for the coverage. Even, because when you talk about the, the doctors, they're not enough. We talk about the way and the, the protocol, the protocol of treatment should be very different, and the protocol of even diagnosis should be adapted to each, I mean, maybe each country, but each region according to their own uh, data according to our own possibilities. We have two, uh, two people. Can we start with the mic on the left? Yes, thank you. Uh, I, I want to discuss the, the pricing just a bit. I, I, I recall when the, uh, the Safasvir, the dip, uh, actually before that, Safasvir was released and the Gilead representative approached me and when I learned the price about eighty-four thousand dollars. It was a bit shocking. I must understand. That's, however, I, I've come to 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 grips with that to a certain degree. Or, in, in, I've looked at this in a different perspective. First of all, the, I'm very very familiar with my Gilead rep, and the I've come to understand a few things in, from a from a from a larger perspective. I. Uh, Number one, the, the 
the company invested a great deal of time and effort and money in the research behind not only this product, but other products, and it cost them a lot of money. Whether it's $84,000, I don't know, but I know it cost them a lot. I mean, whether it's, that's relevant to $84,000, it still seems like a lot of money, but there is a, there is a certain price that, that is relevant to the research that they, that they invested in, in producing the product. And of course, they have to pay the, the, the staff of the, sal the, the salaries and the investigators and the research. Like, I'm sure everyone on the panel wants to get paid as well, so do I want to get paid. Generic medication, it has become more available. And like any other generic medication, whether it's for diabetes, for, for hypertension, that, that becomes available somewhat years later. And, when I, and I, I understand, I've become, come to understand that the generic is secondary to the original branded product. There would be no generic if there was no initial product on which the research was based. So the generic is a, an offshoot of the branded product and sure that they're able to produce that at much lower cost, but that's only after the original product was developed. Whether it's for thyroid, th th thyroid medication is very cheap generically but the original branded to thyroid is more expensive. And one also has to understand that with, there's a 12% variance in a generic product from 88% to 112%, whatever it may be, whatever the problem is. In, in, some, in, in some cases, it's critical, such as the thyroid medication and where we, we specify often branded medication or any toe in certain things. But with other medications, you can allow that variance. It depends. But one has to understand that and if one receives a generic product this month and gets it and receives and the patient receives the generic from a different company next month, there could be a 24 percent variance. So, so these are uh, issues that one has to consider. For instance, you look at the iPhone. When it first came out, it's hundreds of dollars and it's available cheaper. Yeah. So it takes time. So just I, I have to put that in perspective and I under, it's a huge price bill. But in addition, as Gilead, most of my patients, I'm almost finished, most of the patients have received funding from the company. The poorer patients have received funding. And as one person mentioned just now on the panel, that you have to put things in perspective per the country. In, in the Cameroon, it's $165, as you mentioned, for the gen genotype testing. And that may be expensive in Cameroon, but the same genotype testing in the United States is close to $2,000. So there's a relevance, there's a, yeah. there's a gradient in, 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 that one has to look at based on right, country, right. based okay. on patient, I think, and so forth. I think you made a very a clear point. And I don't think, you know, I think that we're not here actually to discuss the, the actual pricing, but I have medications. There's always going to be issues around um, how do you recoup uh, on investment in RX and D. And, uh, and certainly, I don't think anyone would argue that those who put that investment should not be able to uh, recoup some of that investment. But we're talking about trying to see how we can, in the current context, actually get medications widely available to those who need them. And I think there's a question. So, Ray Shinazi, Amherst University. So, in the context of your question, uh, I think personally that uh, science and good clinical trials will eventually lead to lower prices. What I mean by that, I mean by having <coughs> such drugs, and I think you all think that science is stops right now because we have a great treatment, we got 98% SVR, and therefore we don't need to make any more effort. I think there's a lot more effort to be done in shortening treatment, for example, that will definitely cut the cost. There would also be greater ability for the patients to go globally, not just a few countries when you now have a pill that you can use for three days and cures you after three days. You don't think this is possible, but I personally think it is possible. We've already been able to publish and demonstrate that three-week treatment is possible with, for certain genotypes. Why not lower? Why not go two weeks? Why not go one week? And therefore, you cut the price. Even in Cameroon, $148 or whatever it is is expensive. It could be down if you shorten treatment by, to say, three weeks or even two weeks, you're talking about uh, $40 or less for, for a cure. And I think this is what people don't realize, that I think the science is still moving. It's not finished. And I think that will help with the issue of compliance and pricing. Thank you. Hello. Uh, yeah. My name is uh, Anne Karin. I'm from uh, HIV Norway. Um, 
Uh, I've been working with drug addicts for uh, about 15 years before I start working with uh, HIV positive. Uh, and I, I think uh, some of the people shows here where the, the big problem is. But I really think we have to take uh, in over us and talk about the Eastern Europe. But this is a big issue with hepatitis C. Also, um, the type B, uh, um, genotype 2. Because uh, a lot of uh, European and in Norwegian, uh, Norwegians also <coughs> using uh, drug addicts, they are uh, inject the, the, the drugs. Mm -hmm. and that, that's the reason we in Norway now have almost 40,000 people with hepatitis C and with just 5 uh, million people. Uh, and we uh, have to pay for the best, uh, the be best price we can get for the best medicine is 50,000 euro uh, per person because we, uh, of course, have money. But I'm really, I think we have to uh, talk about Russia, Baltic countries, Ukraine, and a lot of uh, Eastern Europe countries now because the hepatitis C is rising all over uh, in these uh, countries and nothing has been, uh, been done to do something about it. Uh, I think uh, there is, uh, if you look at uh, Eastern European countries, there is uh, advocacy, uh, uh, but we need, of course, much more work uh, towards um, uh, access to hepatitis C treatment in, in the countries. And of course, we, uh, also there are questions about the registration of drug, drugs, which is the first step uh, to, towards access. And, and I think uh, uh, we... Uh, well, I, I'm uh, outside of the uh, co-facilitator co <laughs> uh, responsibilities, but I think we as the community uh, and, and also scientific community, we really need to raise these issues and we need to, we need to really advocate, advocate for this, but also support the advocacy movements uh, in the countries, which is happening. And uh, there are really strong advocacy movements there. But uh, maybe, Polly, would you, you would like to add some uh, comments on this? Um, I think you're probably better placed to talk about Eastern Europe than I am, but certainly, and I, I think, and, and obviously it, it's much harder to build advocacy m movements in some countries. Obviously, Russia has a lot of very repressive, it's not actually legal to be an injecting drug user. There's some very difficult... Um, kind of um, laws around gay people. And so a, a lot of the time you're kind of declaring yourself when you go to clinic, if you're able to go to clinic to kind of access treatment for both hepatitis C and HIV. So I think that in, in countries with, you know, the more democracy, the better for advocacy. And I think that we really do need to support to think of ways of, of helping countries where those things are much more difficult. And there's some brilliant activists, without question. But I, as I say, I think Anna is actually much better. I can't really speak on behalf of Eastern Europe. I have just a comment. Of course, it's very important. I completely agree. We have also to remember that uh, the uh, treatment and access to, to treatment is not everything. And in the advocacy, we have to consider, of course, the treatment, but also all the uh, exchange, uh, searing exchange programs in order, of course, to decrease the uh, epidemic. So there is really a lot of uh, confluent uh, issues, uh, and we don't have to restrict uh, our uh, way of thinking to the access to the treatment. Of course, it's very important, but it's, if there is no uh, very active policy regarding uh, comportmental uh, risk for MSN, for uh, PWID, uh, the access uh, to treatment will be not enough. I yeah. completely share, yeah, of I mean, course, uh, the yeah. inverse relation between democracy and uh, the power of advocacy uh, group. <laughs> it's very difficult. Uh, as, a, as clinicians, being intellectuals, we try to overstep others' domain. 
as clinician our fight is for patients not for patents there can be different forum for patent versus patients uh, india has been a game changer in A art management all over the world what they are talking about a uh, prep or pp or uh, test and treat is only because of india that it has been able to bring down the cost heavily similarly in hcv treatment the quoted price for access is 200 dollars per patient for entire course and in market it is 300 dollars there can be way out like we we don't think of the simple solutions asking patient just to travel to india i am not a from tourism ministry of india but please come to india make a trip to india pay 500 dollars for a trip 300 dollars for treatment another 400 500 dollars for seeing india and in 1000 dollars you are back there is a there is a french clinician there is a french clinician who is sitting in the audience and he lives in thailand and he learned this technique about 10 15 years back he used to send his patient to india and they used to come and they should they should buy treatment for three four five patients and going back to thailand and no one can stop so people can take their own treatment or at the most uh, two three four or six months of treatment no one can stop them and probably if uh, the stalls are still there you go and meet the indian companies there they uh, gilead has been one company which has given a license to 11 companies in india which are called voluntary licenses and they have been allowed to sell up to thousand dollars but they have uh, on their own they reduce the price to 400 300 dollars so you talk to them negotiate with them probably that is the one of the best solution so dream of india rather than dreaming of hcv <laughs> thank um, sorry I was, I was just going to say and you may not even have to go to india in in the uk we've got very very strict controls around who can access um the daas and they and what's what's happened with both hepatitis treatment and with prep is that it's not actually illegal to buy generic drugs to use yourself and although we consider it an absolute disgrace of our national health service not to be providing the drugs where they're needed people have actually started buying kind of indian generics online and we have various sort of doctors that will kind of work with the patients to make sure and they seem to be doing rather well i mean both with prep and with hepatitis c so it's it, we find it really really difficult because we think we should have a national health service than the state should provide but given that they're not providing to everybody that needs or requires it then there there is a sort of legal loophole and i think that happens in in many countries i know that they've, they've done some great stuff in australia similarly so um, we don't have to go to India. We can maybe get India to come to us because of the mm -hmm. internet. Uh, but yes, I mean, yes. you've done amazing, amazing work with generics in yeah. India. And these things are happening internationally, yeah. and there are international like buyers clubs, and, yeah. and really people people re receive the the high quality generic treatment for low price, and, and so many people are, are treated actually in such an informal way. But at the end of the day, it's the patients that need to take people that need to take care of themselves, right? Hi, I'm Rigveda Kadam with Clinton Health Access in India, and I just uh, had a comment on the uh, presentation uh, from Cameroon around sustainable financing mechanisms for Hep C treatment. So, uh, what we are trying to do is for the patients who are not able to access free HCV care in the private sector due to the uh, due to some constraints, like uh, maybe they are uh, part of a province that does not have free treatment, or they do not fall under the eligibility criteria based on their income. We are exploring a partnership with. Uh, with microfinancing models uh, where they would actually be offering subsidized loans to HCV patients uh, uh, and the uh, role of the microfinancing institution then becomes to actually then uh, act as the delivery mechanism where they go and spread awareness about the scheme. They're able to then uh, assess the economic status of the patient and then follow up regularly. And the way the donors or the investment investors step in is that they offer subsidies on the interest rates and are able to provide a rolling pool of funds over the years and that is able to treat that many more patients. Hi, I'm Anna uh, Tukova, a pediatrician from London, uh, originally from Russia, so it's a very interesting conversation going on. But uh, I would like to ask your opinion and maybe some net practical steps uh, on uh, uh, routine testing for hepatitis C in pregnancy. 
So this is the first question, uh, because uh, it's been shown that it's actually cost effective if you add a, a screen test in addition to other tests in pregnancy. The second question is, uh, do we want to start discussing about possibilities of treating hepatitis C in pregnancy in order to kill two birds at the same time to treat the woman and prevent transmission? <laughs> I take the second question. <laughs> Now, uh, as you know, we, we don't have uh, any information regarding the safety of these drugs uh, during pregnancy. And uh, by opposition with uh, uh, HBV infection, the risk of mother-to-child infection is low. It is uh, around 10%, 20% for the old HIV co-infected mother without uh, antiretroviral treatment. But now it is around 5 to 10% and uh, more than half of the infected uh, children uh, spontaneously resolved the, the infection. So at the end, you have a risk around 3 to 5% of mother-to-child transmission. So given the uncertainties uh, regarding the safety, given the very low risk of mother-to-child transmission, probably there is uh, no way to consider the treatment during pregnancy. I, I understand, of course, uh, uh, dual uh, interest, but um, the recommendation is mainly to, to, to s test uh, the, the children around two years of age. And of course, in the future, it will be possible to cure them if this minority of infected uh, uh, children uh, have uh, access to the treatment. So uh, I will not give the recommendation to treat uh, pregnant women. Uh, by opposition, we recommend to test for HCV uh, pregnant women like for HBV. Of course, for HBV, there is a, a very uh, a potent prophylaxis with serovaccination vaccination of the newborn and also with a, a preemptive treatment with stenophovir in those mothers with a very high viral load. Uh, it will be different uh, as a policy if we test uh, pregnant women. It will be mainly this screening policy in order to identify who to treat and in this situation to treat after delivery, probably after uh, breastfeeding. Just, and further to that, it's also a potential preventative mechanism because many women who will have their first pregnancy will have a second and if you could treat in the interval then you yep. remove that risk or to consider screening women who are considering pregnancy and, and offering treatment before they become pregnant is another way to reduce those risks of transmission. Is there another question waiting? Yeah. yeah. I understood there was a second part to the pediatrician's question oh. as well. There was a question about the pre testing you talked uh, about in pregnancy. Okay. Answered. I'm happy to. I'm a general medical practitioner from Australia, and I wanted to speak to the question of decentralizing delivery and, in part, to finances. Now, don't quote me on this, but my government negotiated that we would buy treatment for, I don't know, 30,000 people, and that they would cover the cost for people we treated above that. Now, what that meant was that all the specialist units were very happy to devolve the treatment to people who had had training. And I come from the HIV field, so we were the logical place to start. But this model also works with hepatitis B, because general practitioners with very non-English speaking background immigrants, particularly from Asia, have very high caseloads of HIVs, HBV, chronic HBV. So this model works there. So I thought, you're a government, you can negotiate and get some benefit and then your specialists will want to disseminate care. I think, I think some of this is somewhat political depending on the countries too and, and also the licensing. But it's, I think at least in our country and in Canada, there's no question that if we're going to reach all those individuals who are at highest risk and also the core transmitters, which are people who are actively injecting drugs, that these 
they, they are people who have difficulty negotiating the standard medical system, have had very bad experiences with healthcare in big hospitals and with specialists, and have difficulty meeting the, you know, the exigencies of time, being on time for appointments and coming. And so devolving that care into communities, into uh, low threshold settings with people who are obviously trained to deliver it is, is I think, one of the only ways forward to actually reach um, you know, after the 50 or 80 percent of people who are reached are more easy people to treat, there's going to remain uh, a group of people who, if we're going to reach elimination, uh, we have to, to be able to engage, and, and that has to come uh, from community engagement, in, in my view. Yes, the next question. Um, I just have a comment going back to uh, the perinatal transmission of hepatitis C. I am an obstetrician gynecologist at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, and we're currently doing a phase one study of lodipasvir and sofosfavir in pregnancy. Our primary outcome is pharmacokinetics, and of course we'll get some safety and virologic clearance data. Um, it's a very small study, but it will be kind of our first insight to uh, looking at this issue of whether or not we can uh, give these DAAs in pregnant women, and we hope so far it's looked pretty good. So, um, <clears throat> because as an obstetrician gynecologist, I see that a lot of uh, women in my community, very close to the Appalachian chain, a very rural and impoverished community, they don't seek health care unless they're pregnant. And so, I think that is a, perhaps an ideal window of opportunity to treat um, the pregnant woman and perhaps engage the partner. And um, so I think there is some data to come, but I agree right now it's, uh, it's better to hold off. Thank you. <laughs> yes, I'd like to make a comment on the last but one question concerning the uh, GPs involving the treatment. We should note that the, one of the weaknesses that we had during the uh, HIV management was the fact that it was only for specialists. And when we started going beyond having all people involved, then we started having the drop of the uh, HIV uh, incidence. I think that is one of the reasons why in the country where there is not enough specialists, having some GPs well trained and identified somewhere can be helpful in the, in the fight against uh, viral hepatitis, which of course is curable, is curable. I have one question because uh, we are mentioning, uh, you are also mentioning that uh, there is a need to focus on key, key populations and uh, oftentimes uh, we, we see HIV, tuberculosis and hepatitis C co-infections. So my question is how can we do better in, in this group and how, we, uh, how can we approach the person more holistically? Because right now, for example, in the discussion about hepatitis C, we just talk about the hepatitis C separately, but we really need to think about this whole conditions. And, and what, what are your thoughts around, around this? Come on, Stan, come on. <laughs> well, <coughs> for tuberculosis, I'm yes. sure that you are yeah. more aware. <laughs> Uh, no, I, I think, and, and we discussed that, of course, we need uh, sensitive tools, uh, cheap tools, and probably which will allow a combined diagnosis. And it's possible. The device I, I have presented, we have used it for uh, genotypic testing of uh, IL-28 bit polymorphism. So now we are performing uh, a quantitative viremia for HCV. It's possible to do it for HBV and HIV. It has been also developed for TB. So probably by using only uh, one blood spot for a given patient, it's possible to have uh, three diagnoses, for example. Uh, so we have to push, and the advocacy group uh, clearly have to help uh, physicians, scientists, to have this very rapid diagnosis. And again, the uh, concept of uh, test and treat like the, the PrEP now for HIV, is not crazy. It's possible. Of course, it's more complicated to treat TB than to treat HBV given one pill for a long time, or HIV given one pill for a, a short time. So uh, it's feasible, but it's mainly, of course, limited by the cost.
But cost is not so high for all these uh, new devices, and we have to fight to have a reduction of the cost. Because as we heard in Cameroon, at the end, uh, the cost of a diagnosis is one-third of the cost of the treatment. Mm -hmm. It's incredible. Yeah. 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 So we have probably to, to fight uh, around all these costs. Uh, it's not only the treatment, it's everything. I think one of the other aspects we take into account is the fact that uh, we should make a sort of way that we run away from divided or separated way of thinking. We have what we call integrated services. We can have integrated services, I think, at the same time, HIV, tuberculosis, ACV, therefore, things are going to be cheaper. At the same place, doing the, all the three, all the, all the three uh, workup or the management for, the, for one patient that makes things even right, what you call it, integration of services makes things cheaper for us. Now, we have to remember, for example, for migrants, illegal migrants in France, uh, there is a need of around eight visits um, to obtain a diagnosis of HBV or HCV infection because they are not coming, of course, to the appointment, they are leaving, and it's impossible to find where they are when you have the result. And so the COMED, which is uh, involved in the health of uh, migrants, uh, is uh, in a very difficult situation. So it, it's not restricted to geographical areas. It's uh, uh, really concerning different populations, and that's why we have to have uh, very uh, simple tools in order to have the patients. It's exactly the same with the difficulty of uh, veni puncture in peeweed. Uh, if it's too difficult, it's impossible to have the diagnosis. You make the drop spot, uh, you have the diagnosis, you make the treatment, because, of course, you can consider that the patient will come back to take his methadone, but it's never so easy. I think we might have to, we have, I know, more questions, but I think we might have to wrap up the session because the next session, is it very short or? Yeah, it's, it's not too long. It's, it's one comment because I think we, as Laurent Ferradini, I work with WHO uh, in Cambodia uh, on hepatitis. I think we have two kinds of epidemic, and in many countries, we have already contaminated a huge population of persons elderly person that were contaminated a long time ago, and you have ongoing epidemic with at-risk population. Uh, that's, that's one point to consider when we want to address this, uh, this treatment. And second, I think the burden, we have to remind and come back to the burden of HCV epidemic, which is huge, is, mu is much higher than the HIV epidemic right now. So whatever will be the price of the generic, and we hope they will go down, it will be a huge burden uh, financially for either the international community, the patient, or the government. And for this respect, I think, and I'm in question for Cameron, did you perform a cost effectiveness and, and return on investment analysis? I, I, I see you work with CDA, and I know they're doing this, because government have to see uh, the benefit on investing now for the future. And, and these arguments is extremely important to make, because domestic funding will be critical whatsoever for, for HCV epidemic. Thank you. Yes, and that's one, one of our challenge, how to know the, the cost effectiveness for the, uh, the treatment. And then from there, trying to go and look for means, try to go and convince the stakeholders for, the, uh, for them to work for their commitment to the, uh, for, the, for the treatment. The financing issues really uh, rely on that aspect too, I believe. Too. Great, thank you. And thanks so much for staying late. I think the interest that was generated by the session was fantastic. And thank you all to our speakers for giving us such an interesting presentation.